thank you all for making the time to, to hear in the webinar. We're really excited to have you guys here. I'm joined as per usual with Hope Stamansky, who is our head of operations. How are you doing, Hope? Good. How are you, Nick? I'm doing great. I'm glad to have you here. And I, I think this will overall, overall be a really good kind of conversation and, and also um, educational experience for those of you who are just trying to get your feet wet into this really exciting industry of DeFi. I bet many of you here are probably familiar with cryptocurrencies to some degree, probably know about Bitcoin or Ethereum, uh, but there's this whole swarm of really interesting projects being built in the DeFi ecosystem that we're really excited to kind of maybe talk about a bit today and also just kind of get down to the core of like, what is DeFi? Why is it valuable? And why is everyone so excited about it? So the general structure here, will be that we'll be going through a quick 15, 20 minute presentation of what is DeFi, trying to give you all the knowledge you need to know in order to really navigate the space and get a good understanding. And along with that as well, I'll actually be going through and diving into how you can actually go about taking actions within the Digifox wallet, how we kind of serve as a user interface or a UI to DeFi in this case. So we're very excited to showcase that. And then we'll dive into some questions and answers, but hope as per usual, maybe you want to share a few quick things and stuff before we get started. Yeah, for sure. Thank you guys so much for joining. We are super excited. We've got quite a few of you guys on here. Um, as Nick mentioned, we're going to be doing a Q&A at the very end, um, which is always my favorite part of the whole thing since we get to talk to you guys. Uh, but at the bottom of your screen, there should be a box that's labeled Q&A. Uh, if you want to put your questions in that box, um, so then they will be counted and answered uh, we, if you put them in the chat, they might get lost. Uh, or if you message us on intercom, I'm not currently monitoring that. Um, so if you put it in the Q and A box, it'll get answered. Uh, so if you have trouble finding it, let me know, but it should be at the bottom of middle of your screen. Um, and then we do have quite a few people on here, um, currently, which is awesome. Uh, but we are going to have to cut the Q and A, um, to be done at seven o'clock Eastern time. So, uh, even if we didn't get to your question, please feel free to message us on intercom and we will answer it, answer it there if we don't get a chance to answer it here live. Uh, but it's kind of like motivation, I guess, to get your question in early. Uh, we, actually, we have quite a few people on here, like a lot more than usual. So this is gonna be really exciting. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce Nick. A lot of you probably already know him, but uh, he is the founder and CEO of the largest cryptocurrency YouTube channel out there, Data Dash. He's also our founder and CEO of Digifox and a uh, well-known speaker throughout um, the globe for all things DeFi and finance. So we are super um, lucky to have him here to uh, go through what is DeFi and then hope and then answer some uh, Q&A questions at the end. So without further ado, I will let Nick take it away. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. And yeah, guys, let's go ahead and dive into it. I know many of you are interested to probably learn some, some uh, introduction information as well as maybe in-depth information here about DeFi. But before we dive into anything, I think the first thing that's important to understand is what is DeFi? You know, whether it's technology or finance, there's so many arbitrary or kind of fancy sounding terms that can be really complex for new users. And for us, we actually like to kind of break down the DeFi term into not only a very simple explanation, but actually another term that we actually prefer. So let's just go ahead first off and talk about DeFi. So what does DeFi stand for? Well, DeFi, generally speaking, stands for decentralized finance. It's an umbrella, uh, umbrella terminology that's used to basically describe a variety of financial applications in the cryptocurrency sector that are geared towards increasing opportunities, removing middlemen, and bringing about open, equitable finance for all. And that last portion of that kind of quotation or description of DeFi is one of my favorites of, of all, I think, compared to everything. You know, it's important to you know, remove middlemen from the process and be geared towards increasing opportunities that we have at our disposal and trying to remove and minimize as much trust as possible. But the biggest goal here is really providing more utility to more people. And that's focusing on opening up equitable financial opportunities for everyone across the globe. It's why cryptocurrencies are so revolutionary. You don't need permission to engage with Bitcoin or Ethereum. And with the Ethereum network, where much of DeFi lives at the moment, this kind of movement of different projects and applications, a lot of them, if not the vast majority of them, allow you uh, to actually not have to ask for permission. You don't have to do any checks and balances. You just get to pursue engaging in that activity or engaging with that technology. That's a very beautiful thing. It's very different from the traditional world of finance, which always required permission. 
And in this case, you're having a, an opportunity to be sovereign with your own wealth and to do what you want with your own wealth. And that's a big goal here because we want to make sure that someone here like myself, I live on the East Coast of the U.S., I want someone in Nigeria. I want someone in Argentina. I want someone in another country throughout Europe, like Germany, to have the exact same financial opportunities that I can have. But I want to have the same opportunities they have. And that's the great thing about DeFi is that we're seeing this revolution where this is being made possible. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the applications of DeFi, because some of you are probably familiar with the crypto space and might happen to know about some of these DeFi applications already. So it'd be great to just maybe kind of toss some out there or at least get an idea about some of the applications, the types of uh, apps that live within the DeFi space. What kind of services can you find in the DeFi ecosystem? Well, the first prominent one that most people have utilized is lending and borrowing protocols. So these are, you know, protocols that allow you to really do two things, either earn interest on your deposits like you would at a traditional bank or access credit basically taking out a loan or taking on debt to be able to spend it on things, to increase your investment positions, to do all types of different things. And the great thing is, is there's a lot of major companies that have established this type of service. There's companies like Celsius and Compound and Aave, which have really been leading the way in the sense of actual user numbers and total deposits on the platform, as well as loans originated from the platform. And we'll dive a little bit more into these two projects here as they, they kind of showcase a really important dichotomy that's important to understand within DeFi. Along with that as well, the second most uh, kind of frequent use case here is exchanges. So many of you are probably familiar with Uniswap or perhaps Kyber Network. There's also another project called Balancer. Um, not spending too much time to dive into per se the differences between these protocols. They all aim to service really one clear utility and that's investing or trading in the assets that you love. And even though they have different means about delivering on that kind of service, at the same time, the great thing about all these three applications is that you're never going through a traditional counterparty or third party when exchanging. You're able to do this autonomously through what's known as a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. Imagine it like an automated machine that if you input something to it, you're gonna get something out of it. So if I put a certain amount of tokens into it, I'm gonna get an equivalent other form of tokens back uh, in my wallet in this case. So again, this is a really good kind of utility here to focus on, which is that in this case, you're able to basically remove the need for centralized exchanges. And we integrate directly with Uniswap on the Digifox platform, which we're really proud of because it's been able to give us this ability to bring decentralized finance to a lot of people. And the same goes here for Celsius and Compound. You can find these live within the Digifox wallet, as we'll talk about later. And the last utility here, really, that's any of the major categories for DeFi. There's new things coming up every day. I can barely keep up with it. <laughs> it shows you how exciting and fast moving it is, is derivatives. And this is a very broad spectrum of applications. This can include things uh, like synthetics, for example, which allows you to create synthetic assets. You could have synthetic Tesla shares. You could have synthetic gold, you could have a synthetic index that baskets together the performance of many other cryptos. It's a really exciting project. And again, though it's very experimental, at the same time, it's giving us an opportunity to again, broaden that access to financial services to people across the globe. Anyone can have synthetic Tesla shares. Anyone can have synthetic gold. This is a really exciting feature of, of DeFi through the synthetics platform. There's many others as well doing the same. Next is mutual. Think of it as insurance on chain. So for example, if I have my money stored in compound and something were to go wrong, or for example, I, I wanted some kind of insurance on a, some form of deposits on a protocol. In this case, I can use Nexus Mutual to actually get a policy on top of that, to actually be able to get um, maybe Ethereum back that if I were to lose some, in some case that I was engaging with some kind of protocol. And this is going to expand out into much wider ranges and use cases than just interacting with DeFi protocols in the long run. And there's places like Hedgic as well, which are really trying to build, in this case, um, options on chain for cryptocurrencies and a lot of other different types of derivatives. So again, you can see here that there's all types of things, but notice how a lot of these really awesome applications, they're all finance related. And this is something that I've tried to drill in, not only here at Digifox, but also on my personal YouTube channel, that finance is the killer application here for crypto. So if you're betting long-term on crypto, you have to know where it's actually going to be valuable when it comes to actually creating decentralized services outside of just creating decentralized sound money, such as Bitcoin or Ethereum. 
So an important thing to understand when you're researching uh, decentralized finance is to understand what's known as the scale between CFI and DeFi. And as you might have already guessed, as decentralized finance is to DeFi, centralized finance is to CFI. So in this case, CFI stands for centralized finance. Now, the important thing to note here is that it kind of sounds like a bad term because in this case, a lot of people know about DeFi for the kind of decentralization and they think, well, if it's decentralized, it's going to be the best possible opportunity. It's going to be the best option for me. And in some cases that can be true, but in some cases it can also be uh, not true in this case. It might be that a centralized application might be more for you in this case, uh, similar to a traditional bank or exchange. So for example, within the Digifox wallet, we're all about giving you choice here. And this is why we use the term open finance. Above all, we wanna bring you uh, as many opportunities as possible without being overwhelming, but at the same time, giving you that freedom to choose, do I care more about getting a high yield on my assets? Do I care about maintaining full autonomy over my money, et cetera? So for example, here with Celsius, Celsius serves as a custodian or holder of assets. So this is like a traditional crypto exchange, maybe like Coinbase or Binance, or maybe a traditional bank in this case who might hold deposits. But along with this as well, they offer higher interest rates as they can seek out lenders or borrowers. And this is what's known as balancing the books. It's a very fancy terminology to basically say that in this case, Celsius is able to maintain high rates of interest on crypto because Whenever in this case that there's too many depositors or too much supply of available capital, they can reach out to borrowers and pursue borrowers to come in and borrow at discounted rates to maintain a stable rate between what the borrower pays and what the depositor gets. And along with that as well goes vice versa. They can do the exact same thing if there's too many borrowers. They can actively seek out getting more deposits on the platform to balance out those rates. So Celsius operates like a traditional company, whereas in the case of Compound, Compound is an autonomous protocol on the Ethereum blockchain. It's, it's a lot more rooted towards that term of DeFi, if we're being more specific. It allows you to custody in a decentralized way. Your funds are stored through a smart contract that the Compound team, in this case, does not per se own or operate. They don't have, in this case, the ability to just instantly withdraw funds out of the contract or anything like that, like an exchange would. Um, and that's the great thing is that there's a lot less trust involved. It's a lot more decentralized. But the same thing as well that's important to understand is that because Compound itself, though in the future they might be able to change this, unlike Celsius, uh, they don't have a team that could reach out to, uh, in this case, to borrowers and lenders or actively support you in the sense of like customer support or basically have that human element that you would expect from a traditional financial application. And these are some of the setbacks of DeFi. Uh, they're not perfect. And along with that, there can be risks to smart contracts. That's why projects like Nexus Mutual exist. So again, it's important to understand that above all, both of these applications, the reason they're in Digifox is they're highly secure, they're reputable, they're two titans and their industries and they're respected because of their consistency and uh, what they offer. But above all, the rates tend to be lower on compound. The custody is decentralized. Custody, custodian chip in this case is managed by Celsius that uses industry leading practices to secure your funds. And along with that as well, they offer higher rates, generally speaking, as well as support for more assets. And we've got an exciting announcement coming in December. Uh, it has to do with one of the largest cryptos that we originally couldn't support. We wouldn't be able to support just through Compound, but we will be able to support here soon enough. So we're very, very excited. And I bet many of you could probably guess what that crypto is going to be. But we'll be able to support a lot more assets through partners like Celsius. So I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about the growth of DeFi. Um, you know, a lot of people are curious about, you know, am I too late to the game? Am I, am I too early? Am I crazy for being interested in DeFi? And I'd say you all are here at the perfect time. This chart here is a measurement of kind of adoption in DeFi, or at least in some sense, uh, how much trust is being built into DeFi. I think when you put your money where your mouth is, that speaks to where you really believe in something. And in this case, DeFi, one of the biggest measurements that we use in the DeFi or decentralized finance ecosystem is total value locked or TVL. And this is basically uh, the growth and the total amount of money or wealth that's locked within the DeFi ecosystem through a variety of projects, such as Compound, such as Uniswap, et cetera. And what we've seen here is that during the summer, we had a Cambrian explosion in the growth here of total value locked up here, going from around uh, a couple hundred million to a billion dollars in total locked value uh, here towards the beginning of 2020 and staying there for most of the year and then absolutely exploding into the summer. And right now, I think this number is even a bit higher than what we have here from when I made this presentation. It's been climbing up phenomenally well going through the month of November. 
And as we see the crypto market continuing to grow in value, so will DeFi most likely. So if you're just trying to get the quick rundown or maybe tell a friend about DeFi, what's the quick pitch here? Like what's the selling point here? If you had to give an elevator pitch for DeFi, what are the three points you would list out? I'll go ahead and read them out here. More competition, better finance. So whether it's earning 50 to 100x the national average on your savings, and I know that sounds crazy and unreachable, but the thing is that banks right now are paying 0.06% interest on savings. So it's not hard to, to beat some kind of multiple against something that's pretty much near zero. Um, or in the fact that you can pay lower fees for trades that you want to make. DeFi opens everyday people to a better financial experience. And this is the whole goal here, bringing more competition and better finance. An interesting metric that a lot of people don't consider is that in the traditional banking sector, in the United States more specifically, since the 1980s, uh, we've actually seen more than a, a decline in this case of over 66% in the overall amount of commercial bank branches that are available. And in the same time, the average interest rate on a savings account has gone down from around 7 to 8% down to 0.06%, one one hundredth, less than one one hundredth of what you used to be able to get paid on a savings account less competition, less benefit for the average user. We're all about reversing that trend and bringing back more opportunity to the end user. Second off, less complexity, more autonomy. So in this case, if you care about being your own bank and not having to trust you know, any major platform out there, any human contact over your funds, in this case, you have the ability to do that. When you make swaps, you don't have to leave your crypto in an exchange. You make a swap with Uniswap, you get your funds back and it's in your wallet. And that's extremely exciting for a lot of people who have probably either heard of a lot of the bad issues when it comes to centralized exchanges where there's hacks or breaches on the platform. And along with that as well, we have open and equitable access. DeFi doesn't care who you are or where you come from. And that's a very beautiful thing. I know a lot of people talk about the risks that could be associated with that. But the biggest thing overall is that DeFi opens up an opportunity to people who have been left behind, people who don't have access to traditional banking services. Right now, if we're speaking globally, there's currently 1.7 billion people who are unbanked. They don't even have access to basic banking services. And there's another larger term in this case, I think it's around 2.3 to 2.5 billion people who are underbanked. They can't get access to all of the financial services that they need at the given moment. When this is cutting out so much potential value across the globe right now, if we could fix this, if we could give those over 2 billion people the proper banking services that they needed, and also just basic access to equitable finance, the amount of value creation we could have here would be phenomenal. It's beyond our imagination what we could do. And this is something, again, that really drives us at, at Digifox. So What's a problem with DeFi? What's probably the biggest problem as to why you're maybe just hearing about it now, even though DeFi has been around since 2017 and 2018? Well, it's difficult to use and manage. As much as it's open to everyone, the current user experience to interact with DeFi over the last few years has been monstrous in this case, in my opinion. I think there's so much great development that goes on in the crypto space. But to think that the current experience that most people expect when they interact with DeFi is what people, you know, the 99% who have never touched crypto are going to actually utilize, it's just too far out. It's too difficult for most people to use. And this is what absolutely led us towards creating Digifox. We wanted to create the solution here. We wanted to create a singular application that not only served as that user experience or user interface into the world of decentralized finance to make it simple, but we saw here as well that DeFi is going to allow us to build an application that serves as your all-in-one financial platform. The platform where you find the best opportunities, you streamline your financial services into one application, you earn real interest on your money, and where you can send global payments across the world. This is the vision of Digifox. We want to build something that works for everyone here. It's why we do these webinars to talk with you all one-on-one, -on -one because we know it has to be a grassroots effort. We have to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one showcasing the value proposition here. And through all of our efforts combined, we can actually make DeFi a reality for millions, if not billions of people across the globe. So that's our key goal in the long run. And we're really excited to have you guys here in regards to not only talking about DeFi, but also as well talking about uh, how you can actually get involved in this great movement. And I'm, I'm so happy to have you all here today for this. So I'm going to go ahead what I'm going to do real quickly here is I'm going to go ahead and jump over to my mobile phone. If you all give me just a moment, I'll go ahead and pull up the Digifox wallet and we can navigate a bit of um, the platform here. So give me one moment and I will pull it up here.
There we go. There we go. Perfect. Look at that. All righty. All right, guys. So this is a, a demo view in this case and everything that Digifox offers here. This is what's known as the wallet tab. It's, it's the first thing you're going to see. It'll look a bit different if you're just getting started. But this is basically the main home for all your assets here, um, where you're going to be basically uh, engaging in certain activities, such as making swaps, making deposits, etc. Uh, we want to make it where everything can be managed from one page without being overwhelming. So we'll, we'll talk about a few things here uh, in regards to actually using Digifox that I think are important for beginners first, and then we'll go through and actually talk about how to make act, uh, actions within the app. So if you haven't already, if you download the Digifox wallet in this case and go through that process, you'll go through the standard onboarding. Uh, we require uh, that you don't write down any seed phrases. You don't have to remember any passwords because we generate accounts and we actually in this many cases will generate smart wallets where you can have autonomy over your funds with your email and phone number. So in this case, we're having a clear opportunity here to be able to make it where you can be autonomously owning your own assets overall. So let's go ahead and dive into some of the activities here. Uh, the first thing that I wanna showcase here is how to make a deposit. Now, if you don't already have funds in your account, it's gonna be important to recognize this green add button here in the top right corner. And when you press on that, it's gonna give you the ability to actually go through and choose whether or not you want to deposit with a debit card, with a bank account, or send from another existing exchange. I would assume that many of you out there probably are active crypto users if you're in DeFi right now. So in that case, if you have any ERC20 tokens or Ethereum, this can include things such as Ethereum itself or stable coins like USDC or USD Tether, or maybe your favorite altcoin, you can just simply copy this address and take it over to your favorite exchange platform, move over any of those assets that, you know, are already, um, you know, not earning you interest right now, right? You know, that's one of the big things is that if you're holding assets, why not put them in a platform that's putting those assets to work? And that's exactly what we can do with Digifox. Now, it is important to understand uh, if you have a Digifox Pro account like myself, um, in this case, you're, you're going to have to deposit into Celsius to start earning interest, but you can still at least hold them yourself. If, you, if you're more eager to just have control over your assets, you can do that as well. So we have our key on-ramps here. You can choose whichever one you want. We're going to give you the best on-ramp possible to give you the lowest fees um, and specifically tied for your area geographically. And if you have any issues, again, when you're on-ramping, please don't hesitate to contact us. Anytime you can go to the profile tab, which is found in the bottom right, it's the little human icon, and go to our customer service management tool where you can contact us. We'll be happy to help you if you're having any issues with our on-ramps. And we're gonna have some big updates as well on that in the coming months to lower fees even more, as well as make the process a lot quicker. But once you have funds deposited in your account, you can go over here to the little, it's the second icon in the bottom left, or you can click on this big icon here that says earn interest. Now, what you can do is it's gonna instantly hop you over here to Celsius, uh, but again, we can go back, make a deposit, and we can choose from any of the ranges that we want. We can do Celsius compound, and we're looking at integrating even more deposit partners here in the long run. But we feature the USDC rate because most people are interested in the stable coin rate. Celsius right now pays twice, more than twice here, than what you can get through compound. And they support a lot more different tokens. So we can see here down the list that we've got a lot of different cryptocurrencies you can start saving with. Some of your favorite altcoins, maybe like the Uni token for the Uniswap protocol or stablecoin like USDC. Uh, for example, just to kind of showcase what the experience looks like, I have some BAT tokens in my wallet, not much, but just a little bit there where I could, for example, deposit BAT and I can type in this specific amount. So in this case, I could deposit like, you know, a frack, a couple cents here. It probably wouldn't make sense here to deposit a couple cents of a token, but I could do that. I could also go back and deposit some of my uh, USDC that I have in my wallet, right? Which I've already got an account here, but I can click deposit to deposit more. I uh, maybe want to deposit like $10. I review my deposit and it's going to list out any of the fees that I have to pay here in this case. Uh, it will show me in this case that I have to pay a 1% Digifox fee and a network fee. So in this case, you can see here that the network fee is what we have to pay in order to actually broadcast your transaction on the Ethereum chain. Everything is settled on chain. You're not trusting Digifox here um, with you know, holding funds or doing anything and settling transactions for you. 
everything is verifiable on chain. And in our new update, you're going to have the ability to actually see the actual transaction history in this case on what's known as EtherScan. It's a um, open, reputable platform. You can actually see the real transactions happen, when they happened, how much was sent, how much was spent, et cetera. So the network fee is to cover the base cost. And then the Digifox fee is, in this case, 1%. That network fee does not grow. So if you're depositing a million dollars, you're still only paying $3 for that network fee in this case. And it varies depending on how much traffic is on the Ethereum network. So again, this is not something that we charge. The only fee that we really charge to make revenue at the company or to help cover for the things that we provide like customer service and the other features within the app is the Digifox fee. So again, I can hit that deposit USDC button and make a deposit in my account. But I've already got some assets earning interest in Celsius, and it's really nice. You can see your interest accrue every Monday when you get payouts. That's when Celsius does them. And it makes uh, pretty much makes Mondays your new Friday, if you want to put it simple. It's something to look forward to when it comes to Mondays. And again, we could also do it in Compound as well. We can see all the rates here on the right-hand side, as well as all the different types of assets we can deposit. And these are all native ERC-20 tokens. So these are things that you can deposit directly into your Digifox Core wallet if you just wanted to hold them there as well. So that's one of the key things there, which is making a deposit. As you can see here, I've got some assets earning interest right now within the account. And along with that as well, there's another thing you can do. If you have a Digifox Pro account, uh, which basically means you have a Digifox Smart Wallet, uh, you can basically sign up for a Digifox Pro Wallet in the Profile tab in the top, uh, top part of the screen. But for many of you who have downloaded Digifox in the early days, we actually made Digifox Pro free for like the first batch of users, as it was the core way that wallets were generated beforehand. If you have Digifox Pro and you want to make a swap into ERC-20 tokens and trade your favorite DeFi tokens in the market, well, we are the place for you because we support over 50 different tokens at the moment that cover within the crypto and DeFi space. A lot of quality projects that are well-filtered, well-reputable, and along with that as well, are going to give you a good range of exposure to the space here. So by uh, clicking on the swap button here in the top part of the screen, you can actually pull up the banner here to check out what we have available for swaps. As you can see, you can scroll down and see a long list of different ERC-20 tokens that you can swap through Uniswap, all in a decentralized fashion. Again, Digifox is never touching your funds in the process. You're basically choosing what tokens you want to swap with what other tokens, and along with that as well, going through and securely transacting. So we've got it here in this case. Let's go ahead and try to make a swap here in this case or see what the process is like. So in this case, let's say I wanted to trade Uni token. I've got some USDC. I can change the asset that I want to use here. These are some of the assets I'm holding normally in my wallet. I can go here and type the dollar amount. I want to type $10. Click done. Click continue. And just like that, I've got uh, my swap listed here. Now, again, in this case, you see the network fee. Again, that is going to be dependent on how much traffic is on the Ethereum network. If you're trading in off hours, the fees can actually be relatively low. If I could be trading uh, you know, $100,000 here, $10,000, $1,000, $1, that network fee is always going to stay the same. And the Digifox fee is variable depending on the volume you're trading. So it's always going to be 0.49% um, on the trade. So again, the fees here are very minimal compared to a lot of major exchanges. If you're doing per se like a thousand dollar trade on, uh, in this case on Digifox, you end up actually paying lower fees in most cases than you would on traditional platforms like Coinbase uh, or a lot of other major crypto exchanges out there in the market. So again, a great way to tap into DeFi. There's no need as well, whereas if you were to traditionally do this through a wallet like MetaMask on your desktop computer, a really big problem that you're going to run into is that you'd have to pay in Ethereum. So if you don't own any Ethereum and you just want to trade from dollars to uni, you can't do that. You need Ethereum in order to pay for what's known as gas or basically that network fee that you saw. So in this case, we actually will pay the gas fee for you and you just basically pay a fee in whatever major cryptocurrency that we support within the platform. So you can use USDC and you can use a lot of other major cryptos that we support. So it makes the process a breeze for people in this case, which we're really excited about. And to just go ahead here real quick and talk about a few other things before we dive into this interesting Q&A section where I want to start answering a few things, just for some basic navigation. Uh, in this case, you can receive uh, through the receive tab in this case by just simply clicking on that. That's where you can actually store some of your assets into your wallet. The send is where you can actually send to different people and your contacts. And along with that as well, uh, we've got a few other major tabs here such as the community tab. Now, this is one that I really want you to get you guys interested in because this is something that differs, I think, a lot when it comes to Digifox versus other DeFi apps. We're all about building community within Digifox. 
And one of the best ways that we've done this is through our invest in yourself challenges. The invest in yourself challenge is really simple. It's basically that during a period of time, we did our last one back between September and October, you basically deposit a certain amount of funds into your Celsius account. And for every $100 you invest into your future, in this case, you get an entry into the challenge. So in this manner, you can actually gain entries here. And the more entries you have, the more likely you have of placing. And we give away these big prize rewards in this case to the actual community members who um, would be able to actually participate. So we're very, very excited to continue allowing people to participate in these challenges, creating more challenges and engaging ways to uh, work with, with one another to hopefully save for a better future. And these are the kind of things that we're trying to do to just kind of make DeFi more engaging and more interesting for new users. But anyways, that's it for the video in regards to the presentation, guys. I hope you all enjoyed this. Again, you can navigate through these kind of key items here to quick action items within the app, or you can click on the other buttons or navigation points that we displayed in the video. But above all, that's the quick fix to DeFi. And we've got a ton of exciting things coming up. If you like the app already, guys, you're going to love it in December when we have our not only our new uh, challenge for the holidays coming up, but also a major product reveal and release that's going to have a ton of new features that we're really excited to showcase. Mm -hmm. So is there any questions from anyone here uh, yeah. that you guys have? Quite a few. <laughs> um, Dirk says, regarding Digifox, do you plan on making a video outlining the advantages of Digifox Pro? I know we do have an article um, that Nick has written. So if you go on our blog um, and go to how to use Digifox blog, how to use Digifox, we have an article about Digifox Pro on there that's pretty extensive and detailed. But yeah, absolutely. I don't know hope if I don't know if you have it up there, hope by chance. Oh, I but can yeah, find it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel free to link that. So I think that's a that's a great question. Uh, to be honest, in this case, to the question. Um, it's really basically a, a way for you to have a smart wallet. So Digifox Pro, simply put, is a way for you to be completely autonomous with your money. Um, because right now on the Ethereum network, gas is quite expensive. We have to deploy each smart contract wallet. It's a smart contract in this case. We have to deploy it on the Ethereum chain. And this comes with a, a cost that a lot of people don't realize. It was costing us during the summer, for example, basically anywhere from around 30 to $75 just to generate one single wallet. And it got to this point where we had to completely rethink how we structured Digifox accounts. So what we decided to do is we realized there's a lot of people who just want to earn interest and they want to earn the highest interest rate, the reputable company like Celsius. So we decided to make our base users uh, basically KYC verified on Celsius where they can earn interest on those assets. And it doesn't cost us anything in this case to do that. Whereas on Digifox Pro, people can opt in to generate smart contract wallets and pay a one-time cost. It's not a monthly recurring cost. And this will give you access to not only, you know, trades through Uniswap, deposits through Compound, but along with that as well, we're aiming to add a lot more value to Digifox Pro in the long term. So that for those people who want that extra edge on the market, uh, they can really get a lot of value out of that. And it makes it worth the cost to set up for Digifox Pro. Uh, but right now it's already very, very valuable for a lot of users as it just gives you an on the go experience with DeFi, which is extremely difficult to find right now and with mm -hmm. the traditional means. Yeah, I just linked it on the article in the chat too. Awesome. Um, Mark says, when will non-ERC20 tokens be supported? And that was actually a question I had in the very beginning. Um, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. yeah, Mark, in this case, uh, for tokens, that's going to probably be a while. Like if you're talking about specifically like um, non-ERC tokens, that's going to be a while, but we will have support. Uh, I guess I'll go ahead and say it here because we've got a lot of you here and, and we've kind of, we've talked about it a lot to the customer support. And for those of you who are more active, we're looking in this case to support Bitcoin very soon. That's our next one. It's an, it's an obvious choice. Um, and it's something that we can do here with a new release. So we're very excited about that. But in the future, we'll be looking at other assets such as Litecoin, um, you know, any other kind of assets in this case where we can work with our partners to provide you the ability to store your assets and to earn interest. Um, for non-custodial ownership, that's going to be a while, uh, but we're definitely looking at that and basically creating an experience where you can have a multi multi-coin wallet in this case where you could store any assets you want in a non-custodial way if so if you so choose to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it looks like George said as well, uh, uh, why, why are some coins only available for DeFi and not other coins like Nano, for example? So George, this is actually a really, this is a good question. Um, the reason being is that Nano is not, uh, it doesn't live on the Ethereum protocol. So everything that you're seeing within um, the Digifox wallet exists on Ethereum. So it's, it's on a, a decentralized blockchain. 
And the problem is, is that there's no way right now for us to transact Ethereum-based assets with assets like Nano that live on their own uh, chain in this case. I know it's not a blockchain, it's a, a decent, uh, decentralized uh, acyclic graph. When I, I like Nano as a project, it's very interesting. Um, but it lives on a completely different system. So there's no way to communicate for those protocols. And in the future though, we could um, support the ability to deposit Nano, but not interact with DeFi protocols as they're again on separate systems. Awesome. Um, Ellen says, Nick, can you give us some information about Digifox user growth? Yeah, absolutely, Alan. We actually had a very big breakthrough moment uh, just last week. Uh, we passed over 10,000 users on the wallet, which is phenomenal to me personally. It, it, it kind of warms my heart to see how much outpouring and support people have shown for the wallet as we've journeyed through and we've built an even better experience. Um, you know, for, for me personally, I, I was interested to see how the app would grow. And the thing is, is that we've been around for just about a little less than six months now. We started in mid-June and wow, has it been an experience to see the app grow. And so we're hoping to reach 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 users here in the next couple of months as we kind of hit our growth spur and as the crypto market keeps heating up. But it's going to give us a good challenge. Those big goals we have are, are going to be what we're seeking after and stuff during this period of growth. And we want to make sure that we provide the best experience possible to have people stay with us long term. It's really exciting to see, especially I'm um, having, I've only been around for about six months since about it launched, but it is really cool to see. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then Jake says, um, I'm quite new to the DeFi space. How come different coins have difference in APR? Um, surely one would just choose the highest. For example, when issuing Celsius on Digifox, all the coins have a different APR. Um, so maybe if you could explain what APR is really fast and then also... Um, Absolutely. Jake's question, because that's a good one. Yeah, it is, it is a good question, Jake. So the, the thing that's important just for those who may not understand, APR is annual percentage return. Uh, you also might hear APY, and annual, uh, annual percentage yield. Uh, they're kind of synonymous terms. The, the general point, though, to this question, Jake, is that the reason that they differ is because there's different sets of uh, demand on the borrowing side and also a differing amount of supply available coins to deposit on these protocols that lead to different balances in the interest rate. So if a lot of people, for example, want to borrow USDC to go make trades on the market, it's going to usually have a higher interest rate than say, maybe for example, uh, BAT token, basic attention token, one of the, the major ERC-20 tokens, because a lot of people might not borrow that and go try to trade on the market. Um, so in this case, uh, you can have it where basically the rates will vary. Um, there's another point that's important to keep in mind as well, which is that even though a coin might have a higher APR, you might, for example, want to own that coin versus owning another coin. So in that same example, we could make a counter argument that even though USDC is paying a higher interest rate, there's no price gain for USDC. It's always going to stay at a dollar, whereas BAT token might go up in price, might go down in price. There's volatility, which is actually good because you want volatility to invest and trade. So um, that, that's where, again, the, the things you hold in Celsius, the whole goal is that you want to buy the assets or the cryptocurrencies or the stable coins that you want. Right, that you would generally hold. And then it's about putting them to work. Uh, so you not only get the price gain or loss for any altcoin you put into Celsius, but you get that interest in the form of that crypto that you're lending out. So in the case of USDC, you're going to earn USDC interest um, at the APR rate that's promoted, as well as BAT. You'd be earning interest in BAT token in this case. And it's at that percentage that's mentioned under the APR. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that answer is that good. I, I know it, it can be a bit confusing sometimes. Mm -hmm. This whole this whole uh, industry is sometimes kind of confusing. <laughs> Crypto and DeFi is uh, yeah. it's for, for certain. Um, Ricardo asks, why are there so many stable coins, and why do they all want to be one dollar? Um, why do they want to remove fiscal? Uh, now that's why they want to remove fiscal money. But what would be the best thing that a stable coin has to be perfect? Um, the first part of the question, I know. Uh, kind of the whole point of a stable coin is to be pegged one to one to the dollar or very close to it, um, just so that people can have their money in cryptocurrency and earn interest on, the, you know, areas like Celsius, you know, like different those protocols like Celsius, um, but, but have it be pegged to the dollar. So it's, it's not the same as like investing in the different kind of altcoin. I don't know, Nick probably has a lot more to say about that, but 
uh, yeah. what is what does a stable coin have to have to be ideal is something that Nick knows and probably better than me. No, no worries. I, I, mean, I think there's a lot of things to consider with stable coins, but just to that point, you're right, Hope. The whole idea of a stable coin is to is to basically break away from any volatility or uncertainty and give you an ability when interacting on the Ethereum network or a variety of other networks to have $1 in this case. Imagine it like a virtual dollar in this case that you can interact with any DeFi protocol. The problem is that dollars in a traditional bank account or in cash, you can't use to interact with compound or Celsius, uh, which is why stable coins have built such a value proposition as DeFi has emerged, as the idea of crypto payments have become possible. Merchants may not want to accept Bitcoin. They might only want to accept something that's pegged to the dollar. And that can add a lot of value, especially for people in Argentina, where you know there's a currency crisis going on, where the, the Argentinian peso, the local currency, is being rendered worthless by uh, the, the government and the monetary policy that's been able to drive down the value of the currency. So um, in that case, a merchant might want to receive USDC or USD Tether. Now, why is there so many? Oh, it's because everyone wants to build the the pretty much the next stable coin for the mm -hmm. payment rail that's gonna it's gonna change the world. I mean, we're we're basically right now one of the things we're doing at DigiFox is thinking about how can we play a part in revolutionizing payments. And though we don't have anything to talk about right now, um, you know, it's something that's certainly a focus of ours at this, at this company to make currency as liquid as uh, you know, or basically free moving as traditional messages on a social network platform. It shouldn't cost users anything. It should be free, it should be accessible. Um, but this is the main point here. Now, if you're looking for good properties of a stable coin, uh, I would look at projects like USDC. Uh, they're well audited. So we know that there's actual one-to-one -one backing of dollars and a bank account for each uh, token that's created. And along with that as well, that it's created by reputable companies. I think those are some, some key things. But there's also decentralized stable coins like DAI that are backed by crypto uh, collateral, such as Ethereum, that give it its value. So th those are some of the key things I would look at. Awesome. Yeah, and then I was going to find, I'm going to find the blog post we have about USDC, and I'll drop that in the chat um, real quick here. But uh, Ricardo also asks, uh, what is the difference between Bitcoin and other altcoins? and the power of value they can be. So yeah, the difference between Bitcoin and altcoins is that there, well, it's, it, there can be a, a few different points. This They're either on different networks or they just generally represent different things. So uh, Bitcoin in this case is kind of its own asset. It's, uh, you know, it's seen as a hedge or a store of value or this kind of alternative asset class uh, comparative to maybe gold or traditional stocks or properties. Um, and it's really emerged as a potential asset that people are looking at seriously in the traditional financial world as a, a part of anyone's portfolio. Uh, in the case of altcoins, they're usually tied towards specific platforms or tools. So the UNI token in this case is what's known as a governance token. It helps to basically determine who has the authority to vote and make changes to the Uniswap protocol. Uh, there's the basic attention token, which serves as a reward for content creators, uh, for people who browse the web, and then also as well, a tool for advertisers to buy ad space on the Brave, platforms like the Brave browser that are tied with the BAT token. Um, there's a lot of great examples out there, but as you start to realize the utility of each token, you're like, oh, okay, so this token is tied towards doing this certain functionality or this certain service, or it's meant to be used to pay for something. Think of it like any other currency in the world. You have dollars and euros, but in this case, most cryptos or altcoins are focused on providing some key utility to some kind of platform. Mm -hmm. um, and I just dropped the blog post about USDC that we did um, in the chat. So you guys can look at that if you would like to learn more about, um, about that. Um, so uh, Yehuda, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced your name, um, but she wants to know, can you talk about Celsius not being available to users in California? and any ways to circumvent. Uh, yeah, Celsius isn't available to um, a few different users and like a few different like regions of the United States. And I don't know if it's outside of the United States as well, but I know for sure in certain states within the US, Celsius is not available. Um, and it's something to do with them not being able to, they have to, they have, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, because you would know, but um, they have a few hoops that they need to jump through in order to be compliant with like the laws of those specific states. So I'm not really sure like when they're gonna be able to do, solve that on their end, um, but ways to get around that 
um, for Celsius, I'm not entirely sure of, and I would have to defer to. Nick. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, Hope answered it like per pretty much perfectly, like in the sense that um, cel Celsius is not available to some states in the U.S. I I'm actually surprised though. I, I knew that New York and um, originally Texas was, and now Texas I think is available as a recent. I think California is supported for Celsius. If it's not though, um, the the backup in this case, there's no way you can circumvent it. Unfortunately, like the, the reason Celsius doesn't serve is that reason is be, uh, regions because of um, they're meeting uh, basically standard regulations for the state, um, and we're making sure as always that we're compliant companies. So we don't we we in this case have to make sure to meet by those rules as well. Um, but one of the things. Uh, that's important to note is that you can use alternative platforms like compounds. So if you want to still be able to earn interest at a decent rate, you know, for example, if you're looking to deposit dollars or stable coins into uh, Celsius, you can do that through compound and still get a pretty great yield. So I think compound is always a good backup for people who are more kind of prone to want to go towards Celsius. I prefer Celsius personally, uh, but this would be something that you could look at as well, which is compound. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I apologize to you because I, we're all about getting as many people into DeFi as possible and, and into Celsius as a platform. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's just, you got to make sure that we, we meet compliance standards and Celsius has to do the same thing as well. Yeah. Um, and then Rochelle, I'm so, again, sorry if I mispronounce anyone's name. Um, it seems like I would have to wait over a year on deposits into Celsius to have the money I spent in fees to return to me in interest. If I was to swap and trade and move things around, I think I'd then pay that fee every time. This doesn't seem cost effective or am I seeing it the wrong way? Um, or do I have to just make large deposits, deposits, which would guessing have the same fee? Um, but then it would take less time for the interest accrued to equal the fees. Um, I think, correct me again if I'm wrong, but it, the larger the amount, it doesn't matter like how much you deposit into Celsius, the fee, like the network fee will be the same. Um, the Digifox 1% fee will obviously always be 1%, um, but the fee, like the network fee will be the same. So it's actually more beneficial to deposit larger amounts in one sitting versus multiple small amounts. That's 100% correct. Too. Yeah. So generally speaking, in that case, Rachel, I don't know what the amount is you were looking to deposit. Um, but anywhere in this case, like above, like, again, it's, it's best as, as Hope mentioned to batch deposits. This is for um, pretty much most traditional platforms. Uh, but in this manner, in the case of what we have as a platform, we in this case have to focus on making sure that um, we can cover the network fee. This is something out of our control. So if you're depositing, say, $1,000 or $10, you're going to pay the same network fee. So the example I showcased earlier is uh, not one you'd probably want to do. You wouldn't want to deposit $10. Um, but if you deposit for, say, for example, $1,000 and the deposit network fee is $2.50 and we charge our 1%, you'd be able to accrue enough interest in about a month to pay that back. And we're eventually going to make it where that deposit fee turns into a withdrawal fee so that you can basically deposit as much capital up front and you only pay a fee once you've like, you know, in this case, accrued the interest on the platform over time. Uh, so that's one thing we're looking at changing in the long term for our product. But um, overall, uh, again, it, it is more cost efficient to deposit in larger bulks. The Digifox fee we charge is synonymous. If you deposit $100, we generate $1 in this case in fees. Uh, in the case of $10,000, it's $100 in this case. But by the end of the year, in this case at current rates, uh, you basically off of you know $10,000 generate $1,000 um, in an overall interest, just having to subtract the $100. It's a one-time fee for those deposits. So after that, it's accruing compounding interest, which is really, really exciting. We don't charge off of the uh, money you make on that accruing interest. There's no, There are no withdrawal fees either. No, so we don't have a withdrawal fee now. We are exploring, we're, we're having some internal discussions about you know, whether or not we want to make it uh, the, the fee that we charge the 1%, if that being a deposit fee or a withdrawal fee, but for now it's, it's a deposit fee up front. Awesome. Um, and Ricardo asked another question. What's the dif this is a really good one. Um, what's the difference between Digifox and other exchanges like Binance or potentially like um, Argent? Yeah. So the difference between Digifox and, and an exchange like Binance is that, you know, Binance itself is, is a really interesting company. They, they've built a lot of great services. Uh, the one difference that's probably the most distinct is that 
uh, Binance itself is, is, is there's two major differences. One, it's a direct service provider. So in this case, they're providing the services. They're not like us where we're aggregating some of the, the best providers in the market and bringing about competition. Uh, but along with that as well, Binance is more of a centralized platform. They do have things like the Binance Dex that they're working on, but it doesn't have all of the ERC20 tokens you're familiar with um, that most of the altcoins are, the, you know, the coins that people want to buy and trade. And along with that as well, uh, a lot of our services are more decentralized on a broad sense than what Binance offers. So that's that's kind of uh, the major differentiating factors between us. So it's a matter of you know which ones you you prefer in this case. If you're more of a crazy active trader for making a lot of active trades, I'm going to be honest and say in this case Binance is probably a better option. But if you're someone who's again you know not buying cryptos every single minute of the day in this case and you're going about, um, you know, wanting to earn interest and buy a few altcoins and hold them over a period of time. In this case, Digifox is definitely the platform for you. It makes it very simple to onboard. Mm -hmm. um, Jamie says, is there a flat gas fee rate? Yeah, so Jamie, unfortunately, it varies over time, uh, but it's flat in this case for every user at a given time. So what do I mean by this? Um, if the cost to do a transaction on the Ethereum network is expensive at a given time, uh, you will basically have, no matter if, again, if you're depositing $100 or $1,000, or if you're trading $100 or $1,000, uh, the volume doesn't vary that gas fee. It's determined on uh, the, the actual way to explain it for those of you who are maybe more interested in the technical background of it is that uh, it's actually the, the cost to store data on the Ethereum blockchain. We're basically requesting that a whole network of computers, a decentralized network, uh, we're requesting them to store a bit of information that I would like to change uh, my coin to this coin. Uh, when you're making a swap, for example, or that I would like to move my funds to another, uh, you know, address in this case to make a deposit. Uh, those allow you, in this case, the fee allows you to store that on that decentralized network. So there's no trusted counterparties or third parties. It's a very, very beautiful system, but there's a cost to it right now. And we're eventually going to get to a point where those network fees are going to be uh, as gone as good in this case, or they're going to be basically minimal to nothing um, as Ethereum moves to layer, uh, as we start implementing some layer two scaling solutions and Ethereum moves to a new network upgrade called ETH 2.0, which it's slowly but surely moving to over the next year or so. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and then Matthias says, um, my name is Matthias, writing from Brazil. Awesome. Uh, he wants to know if we have tutorials for Digifox. So not like we don't specifically have as of yet like product tutorials. Um, mm -hmm. That is something we have talked about. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel and a blog where we kind of talk through different financial concepts um, like Celsius and Compound um, and how and uh, slippage and some different stuff like that. Uh, so we do have those. Uh, we have talked about also putting in some product videos as well in the future, but that would be probably 2020, like early 2021, if we did that. Yeah, we're actually hoping, um, uh, Matthias, in this case, I, I think it's a great question. And as Hope mentioned, we have a lot of great resources already. Uh, we are hoping that with our December release that's coming up here, we're hoping to have uh, a, basically a nice article set in this case for all the major features in the app with some like animated like images or videos in this case, demonstrating what it's like throughout the wallet, how to do certain features, where to find things. Um, so you can learn everything you need to know about the app. Um, and also as well, if you go through that content, once we put it out and you still need uh, help in anything, don't ever hesitate to contact us through our customer support. We're happy to help you and give that kind of extra human touch that sadly is uh, very difficult to find in crypto uh, a lot of the time. I think it differs us from a lot of platforms out there. But um, yeah, I would say that in that case, we've got some great content. We also have some more content coming up here very soon that you can find either on our blog or within the actual app itself. Uh, you can go to the profile tab and type on the help docs section, which is right near customer support. And that will give you a lot of in-app documentation on how to use Digifox. I also just dropped our YouTube channel link too. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, um, I love that like human element part of it because it really ties into the uh, one of our core values at Digifox, which is putting a face to finance. And I know we have a video on our YouTube channel where, where you, Nick, talk about a little bit more like what that means to us. But it is something that's really important to us, especially um, especially like doing these webinars and being able to communicate with you guys and do these chats is really, really like you know, it's important to us and something we want to keep. So. 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Alan says, can you share if there'll be a different Fiat on-ramp partners for Digifox in the future? Yeah, absolutely, Alan. So uh, for Digifox right now, we already have a multitude of Fiat on-ramps. A lot of apps usually stick to one or two. Um, we try to aggregate as many as possible who are trusted partners in the industry uh, that use industry-grade practices. And with that, we can get actually more competitive rates for lower fees and deposits, and in some cases, um, faster settlement times. Um, the the thing is that we have a, a we have a plan here in the next uh, probably next month or, or so where we go into the new year where we're going to be completely revamping our on ramp process. So there's going to be a whole suite of new fiat on ramp providers that we've been working with behind the scenes to basically come out strong and swinging with some of the best deposit opportunities. Where in some cases you wanted to pay a fee at all to make deposits, which we're really excited about. It's difficult for smaller companies, um, but the the whole thing is that we're we're working steadfast. We're moving away from that the narrative of just being a startup and we're going to start getting a lot of the big kind of the big toys in this case the lower fees on the app uh, more functionality and features with some of our new partners so we're very excited about that and um, we hope to make it so it's even easier to deposit on the platform mm -hmm. um, chad says will i get the same returns on my money with digifox as opposed to going directly through celsius is there a cost to the users of digifox yeah. So Chad, there's no like, um, there's no membership fees, uh, no hidden fees on the platform. We're very transparent about things. Uh, we do charge one fee that you won't get on Celsius. And that's the one time deposit fee that we charge on money you put in Celsius, which is that 1%. Um, and the reason why we charge this is for a couple of reasons. One, it helps to sustain ourselves as a company and provide the other services that are in within the application as well as a lot of other free services that we aim to offer, such as like, you know, kind of accounting or budgeting tools that we're working on, as well as other features. And last but not least, as well, the customer support that we provide, uh, not only for your deposit activity in Celsius, but also as well for swaps and other things to make sure you have a smooth experience. Um, but overall, that's the one fee that we charge that would differ in that case. Mm -hmm. um, if you just wanted to, in this case, and I always mention this, as I mentioned earlier with Binance in this case, if you're like an active trader, you might want to use Binance in this case. Uh, but at the same time, the same goes here for Celsius. You know, we love Celsius as a company. If you feel the need in this case where you just want to deposit on Celsius, that's perfectly fine. But right now they don't have swap functionality. Uh, they don't have the same type of access to the DeFi market all from within one app. And by constantly withdrawing and depositing, you just deal with a lot of hassle in this case going between multiple applications. So again, we think in this case that it's it's a it's a fair fee in this case overall, and we're, we're working to make sure we can get that fee down over time as time progresses. Mm -hmm. um, Brandon says, if I hold my crypto in a hardware wallet like Ledger Nano, can I still participate with Digifox, or is that considered redundant? Yeah, so Brandon, we're we're all about uh, hardware wallet support here at Digifox. The the kind of an uh, it's not unfortunate in this case, but it's just kind of the the reality of wallets is that uh, Digifox right now is an interface to interact with either your Digifox wallet or Celsius. And we are looking in the future to support hardware wallets, so you could use Digifox as an interface to your Ledger or your Trezor. Um, like I said, we, we're all about people being their own custodians. We're perfectly fine with that. Um, and being able to use the beautiful interface our design team has put together, I, I think that that's a goal of ours in the near future. However, um, at the moment, it takes time to build that functionality and to work with Ledger and a lot of the hardware wallets to build that functionality. So we don't have that at the moment. Uh, what you could do so you can move funds over from your ledger, maybe like Ethereum or Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum or Bitcoin that you have and deposit into Celsius, make swaps, do certain types of activities. And then maybe, for example, once you've earned the interest that you want to earn through Celsius or Compound or you've made the swaps that you want to make, then you move it back to your ledger in that case. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the current reality of how you can use Digifox. So it's, it's open to you for sure, but there's unfortunately no way where you can use the wallet directly itself. Mm -hmm. One thing I was... Oh, I, was, I was going to say one thing real quick. Hope I noticed the time and stuff, but if you guys yeah. are open to it, I'm happy to do another uh, couple of minutes here and stuff where we can answer some questions. Yeah, we still have quite a few. Um, yeah. John, John wants to know if we will introduce a dark mode theme. <laughs> Pray him. This this <laughs> is the this is the ultimate ultimate question. Uh, I am a dark mode. <laughs> 
like fiend. I love dark moan when it comes to uh, design. Uh, so we are looking at this, John. We tried to make the design where even though there are some bright components like on the wallet tab, the base uh, tab for uh, engaging in anything is usually white, but like the top banner or the kind of banners around it are usually dark. Um, that kind of like, kind of actually kind of like the uh, banner we have here on the, uh, the Q&A slide. But overall, our, our goal is to eventually have an actual dark theme and broadly outside of that, have other types of themes as well. Um, so that's something we're, we're looking towards. I know that some of the design team, the whole product team as a whole is but brought that up like jokingly, like when are we going to work on a dark mode? Um, <laughs> but it is something we're definitely looking at because it gives you that cool feel, uh, you know, to the app and everything. So we're definitely looking at that. Yeah, we should have had Madison on here. <laughs> yeah, I know Maddie, Maddie would probably, uh, she'd probably uh, champion the idea of a dark theme. <laughs> For sure. Um, Steven says, any chance you'll have the ability to bring over my NRG coin? Yeah, so uh, Stephen, in this case, uh, we definitely want to support, as I mentioned before, a lot of different cryptocurrencies. Energy, for example, is another coin that's not on the Ethereum blockchain. It's on its own blockchain. They actually just created a, a what's known as a wrapped token for your energy, where you basically are storing a token on the Ethereum blockchain that has a one-to-one -one backing with energy, similar like a stable coin like USDC has a dollar in a bank vault. Um, Unfortunately, though, uh, though you could store that energy, I think it's NRGE, um, in this case, if you wrap your tokens in your Digifox smart wallet, there's no way to earn interest on it right now. Um, so that's probably the biggest limitation. Um, but yeah, the actual core like energy coins in this case, unfortunately, we don't support and we probably won't support it until we have our multi-coin wallet where you have one private key for all your cryptocurrencies. Awesome. Um Ramont says, hi, any other new financial products that coming to Digifox other than cryptocurrencies? What is the timeline for that? Thanks. That's a really cool question. Yeah, Ramont, that, that's a, a really great question. The biggest thing that I can say that we're going to be focusing on outside of, you know, we really focused on providing the biggest applications to people which are earning interest and making swaps. Uh, and basically, in this case, getting into different types of crypto. Uh, what we want to focus on next is probably the biggest and broadest application in the world of finance, and that's payments. We want to make payments extremely simple, lightweight, easy to use. Um, we want to build something that beats out, you know, the traditional payment applications that you've usually used because they, they can have either fees or long wait times. Uh, but in the sense of like features within the app, you know, we're, we're exploring a few different ones. Uh, we're looking at our debit card functionality. Uh, we're looking at eventually the long-term offering brokerage services. So you can trade and invest in stocks and commodities and uh, ETF products, things of that sort, or maybe even set up retirement accounts. These are all things that we want to do at Digifox. Uh, but luckily, we've gotten the major core features here that allow you to, to kind, of, kind of boost your money, hopefully in the long run. And then we're going to be focusing on actually utilizing that money in the world and interacting with other participants. Awesome. Then a quick reminder to anybody who just joined, um, if you could put your question in the Q&A box, that will ensure that it will hopefully get answered unless we run out of time, in which case you can message us on intercom. Um, there's a few questions that were put in the chat that... Um, that I'm, they're going to get lost. <laughs> so if you guys can put them in the Q&A box, that would be awesome. All right. Um, David says, would you further explain the difference between using swaps on the Digifox wallet versus trading and holding crypto assets on an exchange as it pertains to protecting yourself from a hacker, um, hacking the Digifox network and stealing your crypto? Are you also saying that Digifox can't be hacked? And if it is, a hacker would be unable to get the crypto held with the investor's account. Yeah, David. So this is a, a it's a big question, but I'm, I'm happy to, to answer all the different components. Um, so broadly speaking, the difference between uh, swapping within your Digifox wallet versus trading and holding crypto assets on an exchange is that it is much, much more secure than a traditional exchange platform. And I'll explain why. So on a traditional ex ex exchange platform, uh, like you know, Binance or Coinbase. Uh, I don't want to pinpoint any of them. I think they take very strong measures to security overall. And I think they're great companies, broadly speaking. Uh, the problem is though, is that no matter what exchange you are, in many cases, your custodianship of those assets are done through one specific way. Uh, they're held through what's known as a custodial solution. So in this manner, as, as many cases, it could be very secure in this case, 
but you don't have ownership over those funds. They own what's known as private keys. They're basically the password to your funds that if someone were to get access to that private key, that password, they could send your funds and you would never be able to see them again, most likely. Uh, it's There's been a lot of exchange hacks that happen because of this, because there's these big honeypots of funds. Everyone's funds are stored on these exchange platforms. And basically a hacker finds an exploit and they're able to take away all that money. So it's not a matter of them cracking the code on guessing what the private key is. It's that they get access to the systems that manage those private keys because they have to be stored somewhere, somehow. Well, in the case of Digifox, with the smart wallet, in this case, where you're owning your own funds and depositing through Compound or interacting with Uniswap, in this case, you are fully autonomous over your crypto. The only way someone can get access to your funds is having your phone and email, in this case. It's basically what's known as two-factor authentication. It's what every platform uses to keep uh, you know, basically funds secure for the end user. And in our case, we use it as our core security, in this case, for the app. So that um, every time you want to actually get access to the Digifox wallet and your funds, you have to verify that you own your phone and verify you own your email. Something that's extremely difficult for a lot of criminals to get. And they also aren't inclined to do it um, in this case, because unlike an exchange hack where they can breach the entire system, in this case, they'd have to target specific individuals where people have millions of separate individual wallets. So it's a decentralized pro approach to money management in this case, where you're a lot safer in this case than compared to a traditional exchange. But it's also convenient. Unlike a traditional crypto wallet, you don't have to write down what's known as a, re a, cover, a recovery or seed phrase. And it's this long, lengthy list of 12 or 24 words that if you lose that, you lose all your funds. So that doesn't seem very secure. It's, it's not secure to me personally. I know many of us at the team believe that what we've built is not only more convenient, it's more secure at the end of the day because your phone and email are essential things that you have with you throughout your life. Um, and they're things that, again, you have access to in this case. You can set biometric protections. You can set pen codes to keep people from breaching into those, those forms of technology to keep it yeah. secure. Yeah. Um, George says, I've noticed... AAVE in present in your presentation, but it's not an asset available to trade or able to lend. Um, of is that, is that how you say it? Of yeah. So Ave. So the reason we don't have Ave right now at the moment, and the reason we didn't have it in the list and stuff, is because, um, to my knowledge and stuff, Ave. Uh, Ave was going through a token transition at the time when we made our list. Uh, and that's why we don't have Ave in the platform just yet. But we will eventually hopefully have some support for Ave within Digifox where you're able to swap and trade Ave as a token. Uh, we know that there's a lot of people out there who are interested in it, just like compound tokens. So we'll be sure to hopefully get that in the list sometime soon here as we add a new batch of tokens. Um, George also asks, um, well, he wants to know a little bit more about what Digifox Pro offers versus um Digibox Basic. So we did, I did put the, I put an article in the chat, but I'll do it again just in case anyone joined late. Uh, if you joined Digifox before the beginning of September-ish, you were already have Digifox Pro automatically. Um, if you joined after that, you would have to upgrade in order to, um, to, to have it. And somebody else had asked like, why do we have to pay for that? How do I know if I have Pro or not? Um, Basically, we, we have, I have an article that I can drive for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that would be the article is probably the best place to learn as to why we have to do it. It's not something we want to do, guys. I, from the get-go, I've always been in the mindset. We, we've had some internal discussions about how we want to grow the company in the long run. And, and eventually, yeah, you know, you always think about how do you monetize your company. For me, I, I've never been a big fan of like membership fees or anything like that to the platform. This is a one-time cost. And the reason we charge it is it's to generate the wallet on the Ethereum blockchain that allows you to store your crypto. Um, it's a unfortunate reality right now that it costs so much to be able to deploy these contracts, but it's because so many people are using the Ethereum network. And with its current throughput ability, uh, there's, there's not much room in this case. So the room that exists to actually create contracts or make transactions or swaps or deposits it's very competitive and therefore the cost is quite high right now. But that is all set to go down here in the next few months as a lot of major applications like Uniswap, which are taking up about a quarter of the network traffic are gonna to move to layer two. And when that happens, fees are gonna drop like a rock and we're hopefully gonna to get to a point where we can even just maybe even cover the network fee. So we're very excited about that potential as well. Mm -hmm. Um, ben says, when I move my funds to earn interest, are assets locked up for a period of time or are they all flexible? 
Yeah, Ben. So the, the great news about this is that whether you use in Celsius or compound, you can withdraw your assets at any time. Uh, in this case, again, all you have to just pay is a network fee in this case to withdraw to cover that transaction. Actually, sorry, the withdrawals actually in this case, I think, are, are covered, uh, the deposits in this case. Uh, but yeah, in this case, you can withdraw your funds back to your account. And just like that, you've got your funds back in your account. There's no lockup period. It's not like a CD or certificate of deposit. Um, it is like uh, probably more than anything, it's probably the best savings account in the world. You have probably one of the best yields out there for your savings. And along with that as well, uh, it supports a multitude of assets and you can deposit, withdraw whenever you like. Digifox is running 24 seven. So in this case, we're, we're up uh, at any time of the day. It's not like your bank branch that might close during the day or something like that. You can withdraw whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Um, Henry says, great webinar. Thank you. Um, he contributed to the WeFunder and wants to know uh, when they will hear about the future of, when will you hear about the future of his investment? Yeah, Henry. So we're, we're going to be not only continuous, we're going to be doing continuous updates on WeFunder, on our blog and on what, our website and stuff. But in regards to like how your investment will perform, um, the thing about what you, you invest in is what's known as a safe note. So safe notes are a form of convertible equity. So that when we go and do our next raise, uh, where we actually uh, distribute equity in this case, your safe notes would convert into equity within Digifox. And the, that'll have a certain valuation. Uh, you can, you'll be able to basically see in this case what that equity is worth uh, through equity management platforms and stuff. That will be in the future, though, if we decide to go on and do a Series A. Uh, which, is, which is the equivalent of the next raise you do as a startup. But um, overall, uh, above all and stuff, as long as the company continues to grow and stuff, uh, you, you still own those safe notes. You have basically a form of convertible equity in the company. And the valuation of that could change over time. We can't make any promises as to what way it'll go, but if Digifox succeeds, hopefully it'll do well in the long run. Um, Jace wants to know, how is the interest generated? And I'm assuming um, they mean through... Celsius and yeah, cost. exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a good question because some people have a misconception that it's uh, staking rewards uh, and then you could maybe say it's staking. The real way that it's generated is by uh, basically depositing your capital with Celsius. So they take the deposits in this case and what they're doing is lending it out to borrow uh, qualifying borrowers. So the other utility that Celsius and compound provide is that you can borrow from those protocols and you pay a certain interest rate. Broadly speaking, the interest rate of the borrower is higher than what the depositor is getting paid in this case. Whereas in traditional banks, uh, that, that spread is usually very wide. So the borrowers are paying absorbent rates, very high rates that banks are charging because they can get away with it. Um, and they're not paying the depositors anything for their capital. So the bank's making all this money. Celsius and Compound in this environment of DeFi are competing for your deposits and also competing for you to borrow from them. So the borrowers get lower rates. I kind of view it as kind of like it's a squeeze on the middleman in this case, like Celsius. The borrowers are paying a lower rate and the depositors are getting paid a higher rate than per usual. So Celsius is taking a lower margin. Uh, their slogan in this case is giving 80% back to the community, which is that 80% of the profits they make off of loans, in this case, go back to the depositor. And this is a phenomenal practice uh, and that, again, you, you just can't find at traditional commercial banks because Celsius is all about giving back to the community. It's their philosophy. It's founded by a great guy, Alex Majenski, who created VoiceOver Internet Protocol, which we're actually using right now as we do this webinar, which is always cool to think about. Um, he's a wonderful uh, immigrant entrepreneur to the United States, and uh, he's founded many successful companies before. But this is uh, what he calls money over uh, the internet protocol in this case. So this ability for crypto to really bring about new freedom and allow us to borrow and lend and do all types of other things and to be able to get the best opportunities possible. Mm -hmm. um, ben also asks, do you see a Digifox debit card coming down the road? Yeah, Ben, so we definitely um, already have something in the works we're, we're putting together right now. Uh, nothing absolutely official just yet, but we're very eager for it. Um, I would say if I was to give you an honest time frame, Q, like late Q1 to Q2 in this case, if anything. Uh, and the reason why is because we want to make sure we launch at a right time where we've got a good growing user base that's interested in that feature. We've had a lot of people bring it up. Um, and it does take some work on the back end to make sure that it's secure, it works properly. And we want to make sure that if we launch it, we have like the lowest fees possible, if not no fees at all. Uh, I really want to make it where it's the best for the user in this case, um, where you can be earning interest in Celsius. And when you're like, hey, I'm ready to top up my card and spend it, 
it's a breeze. I want to make it extremely simple. So I, I've talked a little bit with the product team. Uh, it's definitely not something we're going to be able to get for our December release, but it's something we're certainly looking at. And we, we appreciate the interest in it as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm really excited for it too. It should be awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, Sahil says, it would be great to know why there's such a big difference between the rates of interest earned between Celsius and compound. Uh, what are the underlying risks with Celsius that aren't associated with compound? And I believe the answer has to do with the fact that compound is very decentralized and Celsius is rather centralized. Yeah, so Sahil so asked a, a really good question. And, and you're kind of down the right path in that case, uh, Hope. It, the reason the rates vary in this case, as we talked a little bit about earlier during the presentation, is that Celsius being a company of, of actual employees, and they manage the what's known as the books in this case, the lenders uh, and, or the depositors and the borrowers. Uh, what they have an ability to do that Compound doesn't is they have an ability to reach out actively to borrowers and lenders to make sure that there's an equilibrium of demand and supply, supply of money and deposits, and also a demand of borrowers. This is something that Compound unfortunately can't do. And when, uh, you know, Compound being an autonomous protocol, it just, it just does what it does. In this case, it, it realizes, okay, we have this much in deposits, this much borrowing, here are the rates. Um, they have no way to basically even out those uh, borrowing and lending uh, inefficiencies on the APY. Uh, so basically, uh, borrowing rates may be really cheap for some time, and therefore the lending rates are like abysmal. There's like no interest to be earned. But in some cases, there could be this big spike out of nowhere where Compound pays a really high rate on deposits because there's a lot of borrowers who need it. Um, but again, it, it varies a lot more on Compound because of its autonomous nature. Some people like that. Uh, a lot of people don't because it's not as consistent for earning interest. Um, the underlying risks with Celsius is that they're custodying your funds. They're holding them like a traditional exchange or bank. Um, but again, I would always, I always try to stress to people and stuff, even though we use both Celsius and Compound, we have them integrated because they not only offer security in different ways, uh, sometimes smart contracts can have issues like Compound, uh, like many contracts out there in the market can have issues. Compound, on the other hand, it's well audited. It's the most widely used. There's billions of dollars locked up on the Compound protocol. And the same goes for Celsius. Celsius is one of the most reputable. It's the largest deposit platform in the crypto space for earning interest. They've got the largest kind of users. They use industry-grade practices to custody funds. We only have either of them in the app because we truly believe in them. I've got money stored in Celsius. Alex uh, Majenski, the founder, has a ton of money of his own money deposited in Celsius. And I've also got some money as well that I've deposited into Compound before. And it works like a charm because it's programmed to work that way. So Again, we, we're really focused on security above all. Anything we put in the app seal is focused, number one, on security before anything. If we don't do that, then you can't have a functional platform in the long run. Um, we had an anonymous attendee asked, we have future plans on pursuing an NYS bit license. So in this case, oh, this is a New York State uh, bit license, yeah. So uh, we, at the moment, we don't have any plans to. Uh, the reason why is because we technically don't need a New York State bit license. Uh, now Celsius, for example, um, and many other providers might want to apply for these or may already have them. But the thing is, is that at Digifox, we're more of an interface into your financial activities uh, with different providers who are licensed or have the proper uh, legal requirements to actually operate and provide the services that they do. So in this case, Digifox, again, is just a, in this case, either a self-custodial wallet or an interface to applications like Celsius that are licensed. So no need at the moment, but we are definitely open to getting a New York State bit license if, the t- if it comes to where we need to on a legal basis. Um, Ty Lin says, is there any difference between using Celsius on Digifox versus the actual Celsius wallet by itself? Any added benefits? Yeah, I think it's like we talked about earlier, uh, the, the ability to do swaps. Um, you know, that's something that right now you can't you can't swap to ear, like a lot of the ERC-20 tokens we support. So that's probably the biggest feature. Um, outside of that as well, uh, I would say, you know, I, I would want to say that customer support is a big uh, difference between most platforms, but Celsius has also got some mm-hmm. great customer support. Um, Alex and myself really believes that that's an important thing to do. Uh, but again, I would say that one other thing too is that you won't have the ability to switch uh, deposit protocols. As I mentioned earlier about Binance, 
Binance is a service provider. They provide mainly exchange services. Celsius is a deposit service provider where you can go and earn interest. Uh, the problem is, is that if Celsius maybe stops paying you a high rate, or in this case, you just don't like Celsius as a platform, you want to switch to something else, you have to go download another application and go through their tedious either KYC process or onboarding process, whereas in Digifox, it's just switching over to Compound. It's a few taps, and then you're already having your money there, which is what we're really excited about. And Alex even loved the idea when I first told him what Digifox was. He loved that idea about like pinning the best in the industry against one another to provide the best service. It's the best check and balance system you can have. So uh, that's something that we think really stands us out as, as, as being an aggregator in this case. We want to bring you the best opportunities. That's our key number one goal as a platform. Mm -hmm. Um, another anonymous attendee says, by, uh, by how or who is deciding what the annual percentage rate is? Is there a formula or just depending on demand? And I believe it's just depending on client demand, but I could be wrong. It, yes, you're right on that hope in the sense of um, Celsius. Now, Celsius itself might use um, a formula in this case to, to make sure that their business is sound to provide proper borrowing and lending rates. But because Compound is autonomous, it actually has to have a formula and you can, you can read about it in their white paper and on their documentation on their website um, that actually explains what is the bar, excuse me, what is the deposit rate going to be? Like, what do you earn on your capital um, for whatever a borrower is paying in this case? So if there's a certain amount of deposits on the platform, um, and there's a certain amount of borrowing demand, it actually can deterministic, uh, it can be uh, deterministically confident on what the rates are going to be on either end. So uh, it, it's, it depends in this case, what platform or protocol you're referring to. Um, and then George asked a really good question. Any, any stable coins to avoid that may lose their pegged value or are considered risky? So I can't speak of this, George. I mean, there's a, a lot of new stable coins coming onto the market. Um, I, I would say above all, uh, the larger the market capitalization tends to be, um, and along with that as well, the most that the more that they're audited and created by reputable established firms or utilize technology that's been time tested, like DAI, um, from uh, from the MakerDAO governance system. Um, those are the things we look for. So any stable coins that we have, we trust and to a pretty high degree within Digifox. I would say personally, for my years of, ex years of experience in crypto, it's the reason why we use USDC as our prime stable coin. USDC is by far one of the most established. Um, outside of that as well, you have other ones like Paxos, you have TrueUSD, you have DAI, you have all these different cryptocurrencies that, that you could use. But I would recommend focusing on like which ones are the best ones. And again, though it, it isn't financial advice in the sense of what you should choose, I personally prefer using USDC. Mm -hmm. So I'd like them too. Yeah, I think overall as well, it has some of the best like branding as well. That's another thing with the stable coin is like, yeah. it's a lot more difficult to explain to someone what DAI is in this case, that it's a one-to-one -one right. peg. It doesn't, it, it resemble, it doesn't per se, it's not that it doesn't resemble a dollar. It does in the sense of its value, but it's sometimes hard to translate that uh, to a new user. Yeah. I, with USDC, it's been really easy for me to explain to people. I was like, what's that? I'm like, well, it's United States dollar coin. And they're like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier. Exactly. Um, Tim asked a really fun question. When will you have merch available to purchase like caps or hoodies? And can we make our own if you give us the logo? We're super happy to be part of your exchange, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the, the kind remarks and the eagerness for Digifox uh, attire and swag. Uh, we're definitely looking at doing that. Um, in fact, we're, we're thinking about possibly some kind of giveaway where we could get out some really high quality merch. Um, I have a big gripe in this case where I think a lot of platforms out there, a lot of like companies, they make stuff for the sake of making stuff. And as much as I love that kind of creative nature, it's not creative enough. I want to make sure that these shirts or these uh, this attire kind of stuff that we make, it's stuff that you want to show off, that you want to wear on your day-to-day -day basis and really is made with good material. I'm a big believer in quality yeah. over quantity. So um, we're definitely looking at that. We, we're, we're going to try to get creative with it. And as we maybe we reach a milestone, we'll give away some attire to some of our, our most uh, loyal and active users on the platform. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's uh, some copies of the logo and stuff. If you, if you want to go out and make a, make a shirt or something like that, that's, that's perfectly fine for now. There's, there's, we actually had a, a Paul Rick, I don't know if he's still in here, created yeah. some Digifox stickers, one of our active users. So we, we love that. 
<laughs> he said, I better get my swag. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Mark. We will have a, a either a hoodie or a, a hat of some sort to with your name on it for sure. So. I was like, we will not stop you from printing out merchandise with our logo on it and wearing it. <laughs> 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 um, oh, he also says he has people asking about the truck and the sticker. That's okay. awesome. Yeah, that's that's a good sign and stuff. I think uh, it, the logo definitely stands out. I think the Fox icon. Mm -hmm. um anonymous attendee sorry i joined the webinar late it's midnight here wanted to understand how i can use digifox wallet as i just downloaded it okay um so this has been recorded we'll probably upload it to youtube and then you could probably rewatch it there so i will i'll go to the next one um pre-drag says is apr a constant or a variable over time and i've seen it i've seen it move up and down Yes, it's variable. Yeah. Yeah. So th these rates aren't fixed, unfortunately. The thing a lot of people don't know about is even traditional savings accounts are fixed. The only thing where you usually find fixed rates is going to be a CD uh, where you, you commit to a bank. And even a CD where you lock up your money for a year or three years or five years, it's nowhere close to what you can earn in Celsius and withdraw tomorrow if you don't like the rate that they're paying. So uh, yeah, again, I, I, in this case, um, the the rates are variable in this matter, but they, they're a bit more stable on Celsius than they tend to be on compound. Mm -hmm. um, ben asked a really good question, and this is one that's pretty important to know. Um, Hi, Nicholas. When exploring the ins and outs of my Celsius wallet, a warning will pop up when starting to transfer into the wallet, stating only transfer XYZ crypto to this wallet using its native blockchain. How do I know if the exchange or wallet that I'm transferring from is using the native blockchain for the crypto I'm transferring? And is this a concern of any magnitude if I'm predominantly using the most common crypto wallets and exchanges like Binance, Coinbase, and Uni? Well, Ben, that was not only a very important question, but you put it very eloquently in the sense yeah. of already considering these things. So you're way ahead of a lot of users because all these users don't consider this. Um, yes, it is very important to make sure that you you send the right address. A lot of exchanges, as you mentioned, like Binance and Coinbase, um, and I think even Uni will have some restraints. Um, you know, a lot of these platforms will have restraints to make sure you pro type in a proper address because Bitcoin addresses look a lot different than Ethereum addresses. They have a different starting to the address. And because of that, you can have protections that prevent you from sending it to the wrong area. Some platforms do not, though. And even if they do, um, it's always good to make sure you're sending it to the right protocol. So in the case of Digifox, uh, one thing that we're working on with our improved user experience is basically making it clear that on the receive tab, uh, you can deposit like certain tokens or cryptos at that address or another address. We already do this with Celsius. Uh, with our assets, we say only to deposit a specific asset at specific addresses. Um, but anyways, uh, I digress in this case. Right now with Digifox, the only thing that you can deposit is Ethereum, stablecoins, and any other altcoin ERC20 tokens. It's a very fancy term, uh, but basically you can look up online if a lot of these tokens are ERC20. Um, any of the tokens we have in our swap list are available. And if you ever are curious, like if you're moving over like a, a good amount of your crypto or even a small amount that you want to move into Digifox and you want to confirm that it's okay, Feel free to reach out to us on our customer support. We'll make sure that you have the right crypto in this case. Um, but I think Binance or any of the platforms that allow you to communicate on multiple chains, sometimes with the same crypto, uh, you can you just have to choose that properly when you're on the withdrawal process. That's the important thing to do. Yeah, that's the last thing we want to see is people losing money. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's one thing that's good about crypto and bad in the sense of the yeah. immutability. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Tim says, who decides the amount of tokens that float for a specific protocol? Uh, so Tim, I, I'm curious in this case, I, I might be wrong. I'm sorry if I, I guess this wrong. Um, if you're referring in this case to like how much are like available in deposit protocols, uh, there's, there's really no limitation. Like Celsius doesn't hold people back from making a, a deposits, even though maybe they already have an overwhelming amount of deposits. If people want to deposit and earn interest, they can do that. Um, same goes for borrowing. There's, there's pretty much no restrictions in this case outside of meeting standard KYC requirements. Um, in the case of like how who chooses how many available tokens there are of any given token, it's the issue of the contract where that token is deployed. So uh, when someone creates a token, they create a, to a token contract in this case where they issue a certain number of tokens on the mm -hmm. Ethereum blockchain or on another public blockchain. 
and that's determined by the team of the creation, uh, the creator of that token. Awesome. I think we can do probably two more quick questions here. All right, awesome. Uh, Mark says, what are the tax impl impl yeah, can't talk. Impl implications? <laughs> It's, it's what happens after doing an hour and a half of webinar. <laughs> what are the tax implications of earning interest in a decentralized environment versus a traditional bank environment? Yeah, Mark. So basically, uh, there's not much difference. Uh, if you earn interest in coming to bank, it's the same uh, tax implications of uh, depositing money in Celsius or Compound. And the same goes for making trades or swaps in Uniswap. If you uh, buy a crypto, it goes up 50% and you sell it, that's a capital gains event. Uh, I'm assuming in this case, Mark, that you're, you're possibly in the United States. That will vary in this case if you're going into other countries. Um, you guys have, you know, in, in the US has very different tax laws. Uh, there's sometimes different state taxes. But broadly speaking, a lot of the tax implementations for income are going to be on a federal level in the United States. And they vary in European countries. They vary throughout Latin America and other regions. So um, in this case, you're, you're mainly just going to want to check what those rates are for those different types of taxable events. And then we actually, at the end of the year, in this case, are going to provide a full list of all your activities and your accounts. So you can actually go to a tax accountant or you can actually calculate the numbers yourself. But it'll show like your profit and loss um, for your swaps within the platform and also any interest income. So that, that'll be a way where you can actually be able to manage things. <laughs> Paul Rick said something funny. He said, capital gains. Sorry, my ledger fell off the boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but we, we want to make sure in this case that as much as taxes can be a bit of a burden sometimes, uh, that we make sure that people have the resources necessary to be able to go out and pay their taxes properly to the IRS, uh, as well as other tax authorities. So again, that's something that I think uh, we, we can do a lot to improve and make, uh, make better for our users. All right, last question here from Alfred. Um, how does the APR work? Do you get that interest in US, United States dollars or is that interest paid out using whatever token is invested? Um, and actually the way Celsius does it is you can choose if you go through their platform, whether you want your interest in sell token or if you want it in the token that you've invested. Um, Digifox will do it with uh, the latter version. So, um, if you deposit into Celsius in Digifox, like any, like say you deposit some Ethereum, your interest earned is going to be in Ethereum. Um, as like same as if you did USDC, it's going to be in USDC. Yeah, exactly. In this case, in Digifox, you, you earn the token that you deposit. Um, so in the sense of, um, you know, the question you asked here, how does APR work? Uh, do you get the uh, interest as US dollars or as interest paid in whatever token is invested? Yeah, in that case, that's the first answer. Um, now, if you, for example, deposit an altcoin, right? Let's, as I mentioned earlier, I used like BAT token as an example or um, Chainlink token, right? That's one we've had a lot of people depositing. Um, the thing is, is that you're not only exposed, you, you get the interest in this case. So at the end of the year, you should have five, let's say the rate is 5% and it stays there the entire year. You would have 5% more chain link than you had the year before. So if I had a hundred chain link, I'd have generally speaking about 105 at the end of the year, maybe even a little bit more because it's compounding every week. Mm -hmm. Um, the thing to keep in mind though, is that you are still exposed in dollar terms to the price gain or loss of the chain link tokens. So let's say that each token was just, again, just keeping things simple. Let's say that each token were a dollar when I uh, deposited them and I had a hundred tokens. So I had a hundred dollars of capital in uh, the protocol and I could gain 5% interest. So I have 5% more links. So I would have a, the equivalent of 105 link. Maybe let's say during that time period that year, chain link doubles in this case. I now not only have the original $100 now going towards $200, mm -hmm. but also my 5% interest now equivalently actually being around 10% interest because the price doubled. Um, so in this case, I've made, uh, you know, in this case, $200, uh, $10 in this case, right? Or excuse me, I, I might be doing my math wrong there in that case. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyways, uh, broadly speaking, no, I think that is right in that case, but broadly speaking, in this case, you'd have uh, even more in this case because the actual gain of the crypto. Um, but that also can go the other way, 
if Chainlink goes down to 50 cents or a lower valuation, you're still getting hit by that negative hit. It would be, the only thing though is it's really a comparison of would you just want to hold your assets and not earn any interest, or would you like to earn interest? And that's the the really simple answer I think lies there, which is that many people would choose the latter. They want to earn interest while they hold their assets. Make that money. Yeah. <laughs> Putting it to work. If, if you don't put your money to work, uh, you'll have to work for your money. That's like the, mm-hmm. the general thesis is uh, we want to make sure you can have your money working for you and mm-hmm. hopefully save for a better future. <laughs> you need to, somebody put that on a t-shirt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas Merton, 2020. Um, awesome. Well, I know we have many, many, many more questions and I've kind of read through a lot of them while Nick was talking and they're all very, really, like really good questions. So if you guys could please ask them in the uh, in intercom in our chat. Uh, one of the questions was, "What is intercom?" Intercom is um, our customer support chat. So um, in the app, if you go all the way to the right hand side and the profile tab, you can go contact support and you can ask us a question there, or you can ask us a question on digitbox.finance. There's a little chat box on the bottom right hand corner, um, and you can mm-hmm. ask us your question there. We unfortunately do have to go. We've kept Nick past his time. <laughs> so it's my bedtime, guys. It's my bedtime. <laughs> just kidding. No, I'm, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But... No, no, I just want to say I appreciate you all joining. Thank you as well, Hope, for, for joining me as always and stuff. It's always a lot of fun having you here. And um, just to everyone, like Hope said, don't hesitate at all. Leave your questions and customer support. We'll, we'll try to get to them tonight or tomorrow. Um, you know, and make sure we can hopefully answer any questions you might have, any burning questions about Digifox. And uh, again, I, I saw a lot of you as well saying, you know, stories about like sharing with your friends and family. We've got a lot of exciting things coming soon. So the more people you can get on, the better. And uh, hopefully, you know, share that vision of like getting more people involved in better finance. That's what this is all about. As I went and said earlier, it's all about open finance and making sure that everyone can have an equitable opportunity to better finance. Because if we can't make it equitable, as equitable as possible for everyone, we can't truly have an equitable world. So that's the long-term goal. And uh, hopefully Digifox can make it happen. And it's only going to be possible with all of you guys. So thank you all for making the time. (music) 